This is Q on CBC Radio 1 across Canada, Sirius 137, and from PRI, Public Radio International in the United States, and on Bold Television. Dr. David Suzuki, environmentalist, activist, scientist, broadcaster, recipient of 22 honorary degrees in Canada, the United States, and Australia. And according to last year's Reader's Digest poll, the most trusted Canadian. You'd think that after 40 years as a broadcaster, doing everything from Suzuki on science to quirks and quarks to the nature of things and the bottom line, we would know every facet of this most public of public intellectuals. But apparently that is not the case. There is a sensitive emotional portrait to be found in Sterla Gunnarsson's acclaimed new documentary, Force of Nature, The David Suzuki Movie. The movie is a surprising and thoughtful essay that mixes clips from David Suzuki's recent legacy lecture alongside his very personal reflections on his life's work as a father, husband, and son. The film won the People's Choice Documentary Prize at the 2010 Toronto International Film Festival. And director Sterla Gunnarsson and Dr. David Suzuki join me now live in Studio Q. Hello to the both of you. Hey, Jen. Good to be here. Pleasure to have you back here. This film is, uh, well, it's certainly two things. It's a a forceful environmental essay and a deeply personal portrait. David, where did this documentary start for you? Well, it certainly didn't start uh, in any way in my mind when when I was approached by E1, Entertainment One, with the idea of doing a, a feature film. I was very excited about the idea of being involved in a feature film because it's a very different kind of audience from a television audience. I mean, a a TV audience is watching and they're distracted, all kinds of things are going on, but a a movie audience, they've paid money to go in, they're going to sit there for 90 minutes to uh, two hours and concentrate on what you're, what's going on. And so I thought, what a great opportunity. I'd I'd gone to see Dances with Wolves with uh, First Nations friends and that was an amazing experience. Not a documentary. Not a documentary. Right. And people came out of there just walking on air, you know. So so it was an exciting possibility. But I had this idea, grand idea of an avatar-type film with lots of animation, <laughs> starting with the Big Bang and going all the way through the evolution of Are the solar joking? system. Are you joking? No, 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 I'm serious. serious. Yeah, okay. The evolution of the solar system, the evolution <laughs> of life on Earth, and, you know, ending up with humans at the very end. But it morphed. Uh, very much, and it was really Sterla's film. This is Sterla's film, and well, and creation. apparently a great disappointment that it's not. It doesn't have blue f- flying uh, aliens <laughs> and, <laughs> and and three D glasses associated with it. Sterla, this uh, tell me where this documentary started for you. Was it was this a cause film in the beginning for you? Was this are, are you an environmentalist? Was it was that part of the passion to make this? No, I think I was the perfect person to make this film because I'm suspicious of anybody who's sure of anything. Um, I mean, you know, certainly David and I share certain things in common. We've both sort of, we're both BC boys. We've both experienced the kind of mystery and awe of the, of, of the natural world and, you know, under the BC sky. And, um, um, and, and I think that my sentiments are, are certainly on the environmental side of life, but I'm not an activist and I haven't been. This began for me with, um, well, it was an invitation to meet David, really. And I was an undergrad at, at UBC when David was kind of a mm. rock star professor there, so I admired him for 30 years. And um, I wasn't sure whether there was a film to be made or not, but I was really happy to meet him. <laughs> and uh, we started having these great big metaphysical conversations about you know, the history of time and you know, the sort of evolution, the consciousness, all that stuff. But as the conversations uh, sort of evolved, I found myself becoming more and more fascinated with David himself. Mm. And um, with the sort of particular moment in his life, I think that he was at, is at, where, um, you know, on the one hand, he's on fire getting the message out. I've never seen anybody with so much energy and uh, crisscrossing the country, just trying to get the message across to people. On the other hand, he's a very reflective point in his life. He's sort of contemplating mortality. He's taking stock, uh, trying to sort of make sense of what his life's been all about. Well, reflective is certainly something we see in this film. And and, and David, uh, it's particularly, you're particularly naked in this film, uh, speaking emotionally and and, uh, personally. Uh, When you started to get a sense of where this documentary is going, did you have any idea it would become so... 
personal and emotional to no see that we'd idea. be seeing your tears on this. When, w- yeah, those things were pulled out of me uh, <laughs> by Sterla. I had no idea that they were coming. Uh, you know, I thought really once the, the idea was, hey, let's base it on this idea. A lot of universities, when there's a preeminent or beloved professor at the end of her or his career, they ask them to summarize a lifetime of thinking and they give the last lecture. Yeah. Well, I taught at UBC for 39 years. They never asked me to give a last lecture, but right. we fell on this device of let's give a last lecture. Now, I thought it was going to be kind of an Al Gore kind of film, you know, professor up there giving all this stuff. And I kept <coughs> asking Sterling, what, how the hell are you going to do this? Like, it's going to be really boring. And, and I was still stuck on the an inconvenient truth kind of mode. <laughs> And, you know, when I realized this guy is going to take a 74-year-old life and he's going to collapse it into 90 minutes and I have no idea what he's going to do with it, it was a very frightening time. Well, people often talk about this when they agree to have a biography made or do an autobiography where it's one thing to sort of say, oh, yeah, well, sure, let's, we'll do a story, a story of my life. It might even be a stroke of the ego. It's another to actually come to terms with the fact that you're going to have to relive or go to those places, uh, those painful memories, which is what right. where you went in, in this film. And re- reveal some things that I don't dwell on because they are painful. Uh, for me, the, the big moment was when, and I can't remember when it happened, when I felt I, I trust this man and he will treat me with, with respect and dignity, and gave it over, basically, and said, okay, it's your film, Sterla. Just, you know, tell me what to do. And that was a big act of faith on my part. Sterla, when did you know that you wanted to go beyond uh, filming the lecture, the Inconvenient Truth style, if you will, and and really look at David's life? Well, the you know, we really kind of retrofitted the lecture into the movie, in fact. Um, it, it, it needed a an act of present tense, mm. something, you know, an event to build it around. And, and so the lecture became that event. And we, you know, we created, I think, quite a beautiful production design around it and made it stunning. But I never wanted it to be, you know, a PowerPoint kind of illustrated lecture. It was more, what we built around it was more kind of um, evocative, impressionistic kind of stuff. I mean, for me, the question was always, can I get past franchise Suzuki? You know, can I, I, you know, because talking to David, I realized there's somebody here that I've never seen on television. There's, there's somebody here I haven't seen before. Can, you know, is it possible to get that person on film? And I think... It's funny, interesting because of all people, we don't think of David Suzuki as, as franchise Suzuki in the, sen- you know, in the sense that he seems accessible and very open about who he is and what he is when we see him on TV. But there's a deeper level that we see in this film, for sure. Yeah, and I think, you know, that, that was the big question in my mind. I think really the breakthrough was when we spent three days hiking up to Lake Beatrice <laughs> with hundreds of pounds of film equipment and... David said, he said, you know, on television, we would have just parked in the parking lot. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. and, you know, and we had people saying that to us. Come on, guys. Like, you know, one tree looks the same as the other. You really have to hike up there. But, you know, you hike and you get to know each other and you earn something. You earn a certain amount of trust. You're finally out at Suzuki. You're a fraud. <laughs> finally. Somebody is... Uh, it's your own. <laughs> Anybody that thinks television is reality, you got another thing coming. <laughs> in this film, viewers learn about the impact um, uh, that the Japanese internment had on you and, and your family during the Second World War. Specifically, you describe the loss of power and pride your father experienced. As a role model, how do you think his trauma shaped you growing up? Well, that, that's an interesting question because my father w- and mother were born and raised in Canada, had never been to Japan. So, uh, and I reckon their age was about 30 or 31 years old. They had three kids at the time. And, uh, you know, the world was looking up. They were, they'd come through the Depression. And then, bang, they lost all rights of citizenship. First of all, I think the hard part was the humiliation, the loss of face. And I don't think dad ever recovered from that. Uh, he really didn't have that aspiration to, to do well or, or anything. He just made a living to, to get the family through school. But I think he really saw me, thinking back on it, he saw me as his vindication, the example 
that we are worthwhile human beings and it was a mistake to, to deprive of, us of all rights. So in many ways, this never came out in the film. I, I, I've just given a lecture to a Japanese Canadian group and started thinking about it. In many ways, I was the proof that we were, we were okay, we were worthwhile. But what Canadians. about you? When your dad goes through what he went through, I mean, the whole family did, but you, you watch your dad, yeah. your role model. What did you do with the anger? Well, I mean, for a long time, I was as bitter as my father or angry. Uh, certainly, when I got the, my job at UBC, this is in 1962, I called my father and said, Dad, I've got a job at, in Vancouver. Now, my father had never talked much about the con evacuation. And the first thing he said is, why are you going back there? They kicked us out. So it was that, you know, close to the surface. Yeah. Now, uh, but what I saw that bitterness do was it really, w what good is it to be angry and bitter? I mean, it, it only eats away at, at yourself. My father treated my, my wife-to-be very, very badly in the, in the year that we were engaged. You know, we'd go out to dinner and it'd be, your people did this, or the English did she was She's born in England. And, and you know, he was as much of a bigot as, uh, as the people he was so angry and at. And so were you almost. At some well, you, that, you say in the film, I mean, this is a side of you that we don't see either. We know you are strong and powerful and, and, and a man of conviction, but we don't necessarily see you usually as angry and bitter. And you talk about, particularly when it comes to race issues and the yes. racism, and your, your lab partner, Ruby, uh, who is a woman of color and, and, and who wasn't allowed into, well, anywhere. In Oak Ridge. Uh, she uh, couldn't uh, go to the theaters or yeah. go to church. Or... And, and you talk about the, the way you felt when you would see those whites-only signs. And you say, I became a racist. I got so angry at white people. Uh, tell me about that time and how you worked your way through it. Well, I mean, it's, it's you, after a while, you see every white person as being a bigot. Like, you just take it for granted that that's the way they are. And when I would walk down the street, I kept thinking of Ruby. If she was walking down the street and encountered a white person, she'd have to step off the curb to make way for that, that white person. And it just, it made me very, very angry at, at, at white people that they would... Uh, allow this, and I saw them then as as the people who were responsible for uh, the position of of the black people in in Tennessee. Um, it, this was a, a just an identification, having been the victims of of racism in Canada. I just can't tolerate it when I see it, whether whoever it's directed at. But for me, it became a kind of sickness. It was it overwhelmed me, and my wife said, "Look, you have to. We have to get out of here. You can't." Mm -hmm. Now I knew that I was going back to a Canada that had kicked us out, <laughs> you know, right, right, right. and during the war that we had committed what was a crime against us. But I felt Canada was a smaller country. It wasn't as blatant in Canada as seeing whites only, you know, blacks here. And uh, I just had to get out of that. And I felt that I could have an effect in Canada. It was a smaller country. Sterla, the scene when David is weeping at the internment camp, it, it's so powerful. H how do you think a very personal moment like that affects our view of him as a strong public speaker, activist, and environmentalist? Uh, uh, or do you see those two sides of him as separate? No, I, I, I see it as part of the same person. It makes me like him because... Um, because, see, I had never seen that vulnerability before. I've seen him with a really solid moral rudder for 30 years. I've seen him as a person who articulates ideas that I believe in. But I had never sort of, it had never crossed my mind that he was vulnerable like the rest of us. How did that change your relationship with you two? Was it, positive, was it possible to even remain objective as a documentarian after experiencing a personal moment like that? Well, you know, it's not an investigative film. It's, uh, I think you could probably say I drank the Kool-Aid somewhere along the way. <laughs> <laughs> he kept putting me into these situations. It, it shocked me what he pulled me out. There was this, uh, a part, I don't, rem I don't think it was fully done in the, in the film when I got talking about my mother and the last time she saw her parents. We were on our way to Ontario and her parents were in a camp waiting to be shipped to Japan. They chose to leave Canada. They were sick of Canada. And, and I talked about that scene. That really choked me up when I remembered my mother, the most gentle 
person mm. that I've ever known. We were in a train heading east, and someone said, Sue, there's your mother. And she jumped up and knocked this kid over. And, uh, and what I didn't say in the film was that when she came back, I had never seen my mother crying. And there were tears running down her face, and I didn't realize, you know, that was the last time she would ever see them. But that was a moment that was, <laughs> I couldn't talk at that point. And I think that a lot of what emerged in the course of the filmmaking, I mean, we, we began to trust each other, and a lot of it had to do with going to places, to, to the places where right. things had happened, where you, literally, you know, literally, literally going, going there, and where you smell the smell, you touch the touch. Mm. You know, it's like a sense memory, and it, it sort of triggers things. And I think that, that mm -hmm. happened quite a bit. And, and also, I think what happened was that I'm not sure anybody's actually given quite as much thought to your personal narrative as I have before. And I started making connections that you hadn't actually made. And, and so it's very exciting in, in the film because you actually see David connecting, uh, you know, making connections in his life that he hadn't, hadn't made before. This is one of the gifts that I got from <coughs> Sterla. Um, I hadn't thought about it, but when we were uh, sent to the camps in the interior of BC, here we were in a in what they called a ghost town, an abandoned silver mine, uh, mining town. And all the kids around were Japanese. Almost all of them spoke fluently in English and yeah. Japanese. I couldn't speak a word of Japanese. Yeah. So they picked on me. Your first incident of racism My first is actually experience with... of racism was with Japanese Canadian <laughs> yeah, kids. Yeah. So I became a loner. I didn't want to play with these kids who were beating me up all the time. And so... And you I didn't fit I in with the white this, kids either. I was really very much a loner, an outsider. And I had nature to, to give me comfort, and, and it was wonderful. But when I was writing my last uh, autobiography, I wanted to call it The Outsider, because it's what I've always felt. My family was outraged at that. They said, that's not the way Canadians think of you as an outsider. I, they said, that, that's an insult to Canadians who have embraced you. Mm. So, uh, but that was always my feeling of being an outsider. And so and did, you, did you buy that idea that it was an insult? Is that why, did you not? Well, you didn't I didn't do it because I respected what they were saying. Right. Uh, but Sterla said he felt that I was always looking for a place for home. And the fact that my daughter, one of my daughters has, has married a Haida and made her home in Haida Gwaii, which was a place that resonates with me because we were involved so much in campaigns. And in a sense, when my grandson was born, I now had a place, a, a home. I'd never really thought of it that way. This is a per perfect segue because the, the film is very personal, but it also has politics. It has environmentalism uh, attached to it. Uh, David, and in the film, you talk about how clear cutting represented a loss of uh, clear cutting represented a loss of identity for the Haida Gwaii, uh, since they see themselves as fundamentally connected right. to nature. In our cities and our modern conception of who we are, why do you think we see ourselves as fundamentally, to a certain extent, separate? from the environment. Because nature, it isn't obvious to us any longer. You see, only a hundred years ago, most of humanity around the world were farmers. Most people were involved in some aspect of agriculture. And when you're in a farmer, you know weather and climate determine everything. You know that the amount of moisture in the soil in the summer is related to winter snow. You know you need insects to pollinate plant, uh, flowering plants. You know that you need certain plants to take nitrogen and make fertilizer in the soil. Farmers know we depend on nature. Come to today, where 80, 85% of Canadians now live in big cities, your primary concern now is not with weather and climate, it's with your job. Because your job gives you the money that you need to buy the things that, that you want. And so our focus shifts fundamentally. I've got a friend here who says he lives in an apartment building in northern uh, Toronto, yeah. completely air conditioned, comes down the elevator into the basement, in his, gets in his car, air conditioned, yeah. comes to downtown Toronto, goes up into his office, air conditioned. They're connected to food courts sure, and shopping yeah, malls. He yeah. said, I don't have to go outside for weeks if I don't want right. to. And that's not unique to us. That's, that's the same in Hong Kong or uh, Dubai. Exactly, or, yeah. exactly. So the whole emphasis then becomes the economy is everything because it's a source of what we think is our highest So priority. then how do we 
uh, how do we get people to, uh, how do we stop separating the notion of, of our lives and our environment? Well, this is, I think, is where climate is something that really you can look out at and say, oh my goodness, this is, you know, what we're doing is, is changing the very atmosphere and we know that it has consequences. In British Columbia, we've lost $65 billion of pine trees because of the pine beetle that's not killed by cold winters. The Inuit are telling us the permafrost and the ice is melting. I mean, we can see it happening, and surely to goodness, that ought to be a recognition. Holy cow, there's something out there bigger than us and bigger than jobs and the economy. Starla, think, uh, go ahead. Yeah, just I think the, one of the things that I get very much from David, and I, I, I hope is in the film, is the sense that small actions make big differences, you know, and that a big part of what has to happen is we need to change ourselves, you know. And if, if we live in cities, uh, it's useful just simply to go for a walk. Go to the park, go walk by the lake, do things that connect you with mm. the natural world because it's so easy to, to become so disconnected from it and so alienated from it that it has no meaning. Sir, Sir Lee, apart from the environmental message of this film, it is very entertaining. Uh, were you ever concerned that the emotional punch or the visuals would overshadow the message behind David's lecture? No, no. Um, we spent a long time designing the lecture. I, I think David and must have gone through a, a dozen drafts at oh, least. Oh, way more than that. And back and forth between us. And the last three or four drafts, I was working with the images to, to create kind of, a, I guess, a memory box kind of an, an experience that would amplify what he was saying rather than distracting from it. So, I mean, there were a lot of choices made, a lot of things that, that I thought were going to be really cool. We put them in, tested them, and went, no, I don't think so. That's, that's too flashy. It's not, it's not amplifying what he's saying. David, this film is very much about <clears throat> the lack of time, yours, ours, the planet's. As a species, how close do you think we are to destroying our natural environment to the point where it threatens our survival? Oh, very, very close. I mean, we're... We're undermining the very things that keep us alive. We're f way beyond the capacity of the planet to feed, clothe, shelter, and maintain a quality of life for 6.8 billion human beings. I mean, we're simply too big a force. And, uh, you know, there's a principle in biology that we call it the inverse relationship between size and number. The smaller an organism is, the more of them there are. So if you're a mouse, there can be tens of millions of you. If you're a rat, there are fewer. If you, and by the time you get to elephants and whales, you've got to measure the numbers in tens or hundreds of thousands. Right. Humans have become the most numerous mammal on the planet. We have gone way beyond what this principle, this inverse relationship says. We're a big animal, and there are a hell of a lot more of us than all the my, uh, mice, mouse species and rats or rabbits. And we've done that through trade, and we've done it through uh, a technology. But... We are doing, we are maintaining this very high population by literally using up the, the life support systems of the planet, the soil, the air, the water. We are simply uh, treating them in a way that's not sustainable. You're 74 years old. Do, how does your sense of urgency about saving the planet affect how you manage your day to day? Well, uh, at my age, uh, you know, there's very little of what's going to happen is going to influence, uh, impact the, my life. But I have to be able to look my children, my grandchildren, in the eye and say, look, I did the best I can. That's really what drives me now. I'm in the death zone. I know that I have very few uh, years left. Do you feel anxious about uh, having the, not enough ha having enough time to no, do no, what no, you no. want to do? No, I don't have the conceit that I'm going to single-handedly change the direction of society. I feel anxious for my grandchildren because I see every day the things that should be left for them to take for granted are are disappearing. But uh, you know, in a cosmic sense, we're all gonna, the, the sun is going to burn out and everything will disappear. We're not going to go on forever. Um, but in the short term, I've had a rich, full life. I've used up a lot of stuff that should have been left for my children and grandchildren. And now I just have to do the best I can so that I can die without having to avert my eyes from my grandchildren. Sterla, there's a scene where David is waiting for you to ask the next question. 
he he appears almost anxious to the point of annoyance. Why did you include that scene? Well, when we first started, uh, one of the things David said was that he was frustrated with uh, the sort of growing shallowness of television, the the demand of television to be sort of uh, sensational, to be short, to be uh, you know sound clippy, and that's sort of the 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 worst thing you could possibly do in television is uh, uh, indulge yourself in dead air. <laughs> and so I thought, well, let's indulge in a little dead air and see what it looks like. There can be drama in pauses, David. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's true, but I think that uh, the the thing that television really doesn't tolerate is long pauses. I mean, one would like to have the dramatic moment when we allow the audience the respect to say, hmm, they need a few seconds to, to think about that. We don't do that in television because of the enormous pressure of competition. And you know that remote control, my God, I look at my kids, they're quick on that button, man, just <laughs> toof, like that if they're bored. So we're caught up in that having to pound away and have so many jolts per minute. And, and you're not allowed to to let people discover things, you know I mean? In television, you gotta tell them what you're gonna say, then you say it and you tell them what you just told them. And so you don't allow people to, you don't allow it to, to put an idea forward and then maybe another idea and just let that sit and allow people to make the connection, allow people to think for themselves. Before I let you go, let me, I have to ask you about one of the most compelling scenes in this film and it's the story about the last hike you ever took with your father. Can you share a bit of that uh -huh. story? Well, my father, this is when, where we were incarcerated during the war. It's now a provincial park, Valhalla Provincial Park. And uh, we weren't allowed to fish during the war. Uh, and for a Japanese not to be able to catch and eat fish is like, you know, asking Irish not to eat potatoes, I guess. Anyway, we went out and fished, and uh, we caught a lot of fish. And there was a, a spectacular hike up the mountain where there was a chain of three lakes and dad would go up there and I went a few times with him. And he always dreamed of going back to that chain of lakes. He wanted to go back fishing. And I, he'd say, David, uh, let's go up. And I'd say, yeah, yeah, okay, great. But oh, I'm too busy this year. And finally, he, he said, uh, this is in 1992, he said, uh, look, I know you're a busy man and I'm really sorry to bug you. I'm gonna go myself. Well, I, he shamed me into it. I didn't know at the time he was dying of liver cancer. And uh, we went over, we arranged, uh, my wife and, and uh, two young children at that time, arranged to uh, backpack up and we had a couple of friends carrying dad's packs. It was a long hike. He said, I can't believe how steep this, this walk is. And it is. You too. know, when he was a, th a 30 year old, he could just bound up that, that uh, mountain. And then he said, wow, the trees are so big. This is 50 years later, and a huge amount had, had changed. But by the time we got up to the, close to the second lake, he was totally knackered. He was really beat. Everybody was carrying, even my kids were carrying some things that Dad should have been carrying. I was carrying him, basically, and my pack. And he finally, we were oh, a couple hundred yards from the, the, the summit, and he said, David, I can't go any further. He said, I, just leave me on the trail. I'll be okay. <laughs> Dad, you can't stay here on the trail, can't pitch a tent. So I dragged him up that mountain, uh -huh. and he was jubilant when we got to the top. But I said to my wife, he could very well die tonight. He was so exhausted, he couldn't eat. He just went into the tent as soon as we set it up. And, and I thought, what better way to go? You know, he was 93 at the time, uh, 83 at the time, and I thought if he dies, he dies. And, but he recovered. Earlier in the interview, you were talking about speaking to that, that those Japanese students and the way you've been now reflecting on this film after it's been made uh, and and you being the validation for your father that's the early 90s but at this point you are David Suzuki mm. uh, that that we know <laughs> you know uh, one of the greatest Canadians did did he talk to you about that well he no he never talked to me directly but he was so proud it was embarrassing uh, he drove a Volkswagen um, uh, van and he picked people up on the street all the time hitchhiking and if I was with him within a nanosecond he'd be <laughs> bragging that he was my father and it was really embarrassing but I never begrudged him that and I always felt that again that was his validation that he was a worthwhile Canadian his son proved it and he was very proud of that so I'm glad that dad 
you know, was able to take pleasure in that. Sterlet, David indicts some of our current behavior as an intergenerational crime. For example, knowingly driving the bluefin t- tuna into extinction. How do you think this film and David Suzuki will be viewed when it's seen 100 years from now? My goodness. Um, well, I guess it... Uh, I don't even know how to answer that. I, I, um, it may be seen as, as, as something like the, the film, you know, the, the, uh, the fictional film, The Age of Stupid, where, where, they, where the world has come to ruin and then there's a little time capsule of what it used to be like. Um, I hope not. I hope that 100 years from now that they look back on it and see the film and see David and see um, sort of the beginning of a turning point in the way we behave. David, I know you're a notoriously modest guy, so if you can try and handle it and a- answer this question, but how, how do you want to be remembered? Well, I, I said to a reporter a couple of months ago, he said, uh, what, what do you hope people will say about you after you're gone? I was stunned by the question. I said, after I'm gone, I don't give a shit what people say. They can say whatever they want. I'm going to be dead. What I would hope is that a few of the ideas, I've written a number of books, maybe some films, a few of those things will reverberate and continue to be discussed. That would be, to me, the greatest pleasure if I were somehow able to see it. I would, I would love it that a few ideas got repeated. But, you know, the most modest, the kindest person I ever knew was my mother. My mother was always there for the family. She worked all her life, raised our kids, and my dad took all the glory. He was the guy that everybody loved. He loved to talk. And uh, when my mother died, you know, I remember my mother, my sisters do, my some of my children knew grandma, but when my children are gone, my mother will disappear. And I thought, here is one of the most kindest human beings that I've ever known, and she will disappear in two generations. And that's about all I want, you know, that that's it. And what happens after that? Well, that will be. But I don't have any great grand hopes of some kind of monument or something, you know, to remember me. My mother won't be remembered. I'll wink out. It's really great to get to talk to both of you uh, on the occasion of the release of this film. And I, I thank you very much for making the time today. Thank you, David. Thanks, Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Sterling. That's Dr. David Suzuki. He's the subject of Sterling Gunnarsson's new documentary, Force of Nature, the David Suzuki movie. And Dr. Suzuki and Sterling Gunnarsson have been with me here in Studio Q.